Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod to talk about MSU's exciting 94-91 win in overtime over North Carolina in the third place game of the Maui Invitational. Uh, MSU heads back now to East Lansing to prepare for kind of the weird December Big Ten week <laughs> with two quality wins now uh, they picked up in Hawaii. I hope everyone's enjoying your Thanksgiving as you listen to the show. I'm personally looking forward to eat, watching lines, eating some turkey and candied yams, my favorite. And aside from my wife and I now being able to cancel our cardiac stress tests, there were quite a few takeaways, I thought, in the game that were probably worth talking about. First, I think the big news, of course, is Jace Richardson was ruled out of the game after suffering some, I guess it sounds like concussion-like symptoms. Uh, so Trey Hallman was inserted in the, op the starting lineup and with uh, Fiddler sitting on the bench. Uh, and the game was one in which Hallman played really well, but you always, and we should say, led most of the game comfortably for probably a good portion of the game. But you just oh, kind of always all but a, all but about a minute. Yeah, but I mean, it was close for the first ten minutes, I'd say, and then Michigan kind of pulled away by six or eight, and they had a kind of nice working margin. And but you always felt North Carolina lurking, like it just you know you could just yeah. they just never quite put them away. That three at the end of the half did not count uh, by Holloman, which would have been what thirteen going into halftime or something like twelve. Or 12. Would have made would have made it twelve yeah. instead of it was nine. And uh, and so that was kind of a big one. And then North Carolina scored a couple buckets to cut it to three to start. And so it was just never uh, it was never felt comfortable. Then the end of the game meltdown where they I gave it what six or eight straight points to the Tar Heels to send into overtime. Uh, and then overtime looked pretty good. And then there was a, it was, um, basically heroics <laughs> from, uh, Trey Hallman played really well at the end and up, up, kind of overcoming a bunch of mistakes by Jeremy fears, which I'd say uncharacteristic, but he is a freshman. And so it's not super surprising that he had yeah. trouble. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, not we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that, that a little bit, yeah. but I want to say for me, the one thing I noticed early on in the first half, um, was was it was a different Xavier Booker, a Booker I had not seen. He was playing hard. I mean, you could just see he was – he didn't look like he's, he's – any other game we've seen him play. I mean, I've seen him take shots and, you know, look into the game offensively, but he was, like, aggressive, and it was – and it, he just became more and more aggressive throughout the game. And we always talk about – and I – well, I should say you always talk about how the fact that, you know, these big guys, suddenly the light goes on and they're just a different player, and you just kind of wonder, you know, what were you doing up to that point? But – I'm not going to say the light turned on for him, but if if the Xavier Booker <laughs> we see going forward is the one we saw near the end of the in the second half of, against North Carolina, where aggressive attacking the basket, not just settling for threes, but you know offense rebounding, you know this Michigan State team ceiling just went up a lot. Yeah, and and look, I've I've now seen enough of Xavier Booker that I am nowhere near prepared to. <laughs> to say it's all upside from here and nothing else. Yeah. Um, I don't think his, his improvement, his scope of improvement is going to be strictly a hockey stick, you know, right. It's not, it's not going to be linear. It's going to have some bumps. I I'm convinced of that now. It, you know, my hope over the summer, especially after his first game in Spain was okay. Maybe, maybe he's pulled it together so much that he can actually be a guy that they count on as, you know, one of, if not their best player mm -hmm. offensively, at least. And that's clearly not the case. I think it would be foolish to think that one really nice game means that he's permanently, the light has turned on, but is it encouraging? Hell yes. Yeah. Be because here's the thing. Now I, I can think of scenarios that would be more encouraging and that would be, a game where he did it against a team with high, like if they had, God forbid, and I, I don't think we talked about it on the podcast, but last night yeah, before we right. started, I talked to you about this game and I said, I desperately do not want to see Auburn. Right. And I think you've seen <laughs> why in the last couple of days, right? Yeah. Um, I think they're probably for the moment, they look like the best team in the country. It's hard to know, but anyway, Auburn's a team with quality bigs that you'd say, wow, if Booker produced against them, that would be really something. So that would be the top moment. But the second thing for me is a night like this where, you know, quite frankly, and this had a lot to do with why I would have rather have seen North Carolina in this game once it was known that Michigan State was going to be playing in it. North Carolina is a very different team than they were, if you couldn't tell, than they were last March when MSU last saw them. Namely, that that big guy with Baycott on the back of his jersey, he isn't there anymore. 
Yeah, right. And they don't have anybody remotely like him. Forget from a talent perspective, just from a size perspective. That you, and you saw it. I mean, Z- there were segments in that game that Xavier Booker was dominant inside. Yeah. And so that's what you want to see. If he's in the game in a situation where he is, there's there's nobody out there that physically should be able to match up with him. Get some work done. And he did that tonight. We have not always seen that. We have, in fact, rarely seen that. So that's a really good sign to me. You mentioned the intensity that he played with, how locked in he was. I, I'll tell you, something small, and it was even evident last night, in, or yesterday, rather, in the loss to Memphis. Right. But throughout all three games of this tournament, I think Xavier Booker is quietly – making some real strides defensively. Yes. He has he has not had three straight games like this where his help was more on point than it's been in the over these 3 days. And then you saw tonight, you know, he does have that length and yeah. it impacted it absolutely impacted the game. You know, I thought that it was it was a shame that the game went to overtime as it, to some extent as a result of some mistakes and, and frankly, also some empty possessions by MSU too. Yeah. You know, they didn't score a field goal in the last four minute and change. That wasn't good. But what it, what it did is it overshadowed the fact that Michigan state made a bunch of high level defensive plays down the stretch of regulation. Yeah. And Booker was among the guys who were doing that car had a big one. Aiken had, a, had, that. One. had a couple too. Trey, yeah. Frankie Fiddler. When we talk about him, Frankie Fiddler plays this is his best game. Yep. Frankie Fiddler played with toughness, balls out, was converting from the floor. Um, great, great game from him. There, there were so many guys that you can say that about in this game that I think really, really even Jeremy Fears, before the last, say, two, two and a half minutes of regulation, yeah. I think this one was up there for Jeremy Fears' best game. I, I thought he was great up until that point you see what kind of havoc he can wreak when he can and it looks like a deceptively simple thing but it's not and it is it is a weapon when you've got a player like this when he can get somebody on his hip and then get around them and get them get the defender on his back huge problem for a defense and jeremy fears has been doing it regularly so that's something we really haven't spent much time talking about, but I, I wanted to note it because you saw it several times in this game. So there are a lot of guys we should talk about uh, all of them basically because yeah, well, just I think it was through them. I think it was I mean, a lot of good basketball. I'll say before we go through the, the players, I just also wanted to point out, and you know this is a small thing, but Borovic jumping off the bench in overtime when they had I don't know Trey had maybe like half a second left to get across the timeline. Flying off the yes. bench, calling a timeout. Yeah. Uh, just yes. ran, ran right, past, sprinted right past yes. Izzo. I mean, that was a huge heads up I will, play by the I coaching will, staff, right? I, I, and I will tell you, I, I don't know if that's a reviewable play, but I was waiting for the review on that <laughs> because because the actual shot clock read 20. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It was I, hats off to him. Yeah. Because that was that was something, and you know, and again, that was that was kind of indicative. Michigan State did so many things so well, and then just had brain freeze moments yeah. at times. But that's that's unfortunately that's what you have to expect from a team that's got some real youth, and mm-hmm. a team that, on top of that, even the guys that aren't young, like a Trey Holloman is in a different role. I mean, yeah, he's he not been running a, the show before, right? Yeah. This is his first time. He played yeah. a significant role last year, but this is different, especially a night like tonight. It's just different. And, yeah. and so that's going to take, that's going to take some learning, you know, that's well, anyway, we'll, we'll get back to it when we talk about Jeremy, but he wasn't the only one. He was, he was just the one that's going to stand out in most people's minds. Well, you know, why do we, but why do we start yeah, with Jeremy? Ahead. I mean, just, right. 13 points, two for six from the field, nine for 11 from the line. I mean, really just initiating yep. tons of contact inside six assists, two turn to two turnovers, yeah. 32 minutes, yeah. four rebounds. I mean, guy was everywhere. Um, and it, yeah, as you mentioned, just the, the, the bad pass in the backcourt where he threw it away and, um, but you know, but, but that was about it. He was good defensively. He's good offensively. I, he's excellent. Well, he had. He also had the moment where, at the end of regulation, yes, right. He 
he yeah. ran into Trey, and I'm pretty sure what he was trying well, that was to do was turn. set a, he was trying to set a screen. Yeah. But you can't, you don't need a screen. It was too helter skelter, point. right? To kind of do yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It just was not, it was the wrong read. Um, he also, by the way, the the one that was actually biggest in my mind, I'll get back to that turnover in a second. The one that loomed largest to me though was the shot that Trimble hit to tie it regulation. Oh, yeah. That was on that was on Jeremy. And and he was trying to do the right thing. He was if you if you rewatch it, he was trying to direct somebody. I think he might have been pointing at Cohen Carr, but he was in the lane and Trimble, you know, and Trimble was was um uh, perpendicular to him directly, mm-hmm. you know. So he yeah. was he was quote unquote on him, but he he did it and turned his eyes just a half second too long, and Trimble cut, and Jeremy was not going to be able to recover. Now give credit, you know, the, that kid is not a proven shooter. If I had to pick out of the guys they had on the floor to take a three, he wouldn't have been the first guy I would have picked, but he might have been second. Yeah, and so he hit the shot. Okay, but it was a wide open shot because, Jer- and that's what you don't want to do. You at least want to make somebody hit that shot over at least a half decent contest. And it wasn't that because Jeremy lost track for yeah. a, for just half a beat, but that's long enough. So he had a few of those mistakes. The turnover. I'm actually this is me. Uh, it, yeah, was it a bad decision? Yes. But you know what led to the bad decision? Trey, Trey Holland giving up to him and says ex- he's going across the line himself. Ex- yes. Exactly. He yeah. caught the ball in the middle of the floor. He caught yeah. the inbound in the middle of the floor exactly where you want to be. Don't give it up. And he's the guy you want to have with the ball in his hands in that situation anyway. Yeah. So I put I, I give a little bit of responsibility for that one to Trey. Yeah, no, sure. I think so. Yeah. I think that's but, probably accurate. But uh, turning back to Jeremy, I mean, look. That's I don't. That's probably not a career high, but it's got to be close. Well, eleven free throws is easily a career high for him. Yeah, nine for I eleven mean, from the line. And that's again, we talked about. I, I, I talked about his ability to get defenders on his back. That's that's what happens when you do that. You'll usually end up with really high quality shots at or around the basket. Yeah, or you'll get fouled because a guy's trying to recover over the top of you. It's a, it's, if you can, if you have the knack for doing that, um, that's a huge benefit. And Jeremy fears, I think as his career continues to evolve, you're going to see these kind of nights more and more frequently where he's just at the line a lot. And he was, I mean, he was only two for six from the floor, but it felt better than that to me. Because he was yeah. just, he was, and I think a lot of this because he was drawing fouls, but he was just yeah. downhill. He was downhill so much of the night. And and that's a really big deal. Six assists, two turnovers. I'll take that. I mean, MSU's two point guards combined, 32 points and 13 assists to four turnovers. Yeah. Plus five steals between Holloman and Fierce. I'll take that any day of the week. Yeah. That was well, and, high level play. And, 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 um, he was causing so he knocked out Cadeau early in the game. I think it was him getting the second force in that yep. second foul on Cadeau to knock him out, which helped him get the big large lead in the yeah. first half and kind of comfortable margin I just at throwing North Carolina. Uh, I, I, and I got uh, speaking of fears and Cadeau and fouls. I just <laughs> ESPN has got, and I've said this before, but it's it's getting worse. They love. No, the I'm SEC? sure. The I'm ACC? sure. I'm sure Corey Alexander is a nice guy. But if if we're at the point that that team is doing Maui, uh, you know, Bill Walton was terrible in his own unique way, but he was Bill fucking Walton. Yeah. You know, that there there is a sense of occasion to this tournament that I'm sorry, that is garbage. He couldn't get Jeremy Fear's name right. Jeremiah, and, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but but worse. That I think it was Cadeau's fourth foul, maybe the one where Fears was coming over to call the timeout, which was correct. But Cadeau body checked him. Yeah. And Corey right. Alexander keeps talking about he's you see his arm away from his body. Except, no. The one he was no. stopping himself from falling down his face. His <laughs> arm was literally against his rib cage. I know, I know. The, what are you seeing? 
It just, and that was just one example that was just the whole night. I mean, there was even a point that I, and I don't normally do this with Walton games. I would, but normally I don't, I almost shut it off. Oh, turn the wheel team. I'm like, yeah, well, oh, no, just went silent. <laughs> went, went 1915 with it. Cause it was that bad. And the, and the, Play by play guys, eh, you know, just a guy. I mean, this is Maui. This yeah. is the tournament that you had the three man team of McDonough and and Rafferty and Billis, you know, Dick yeah. Vital. You that's Maui. You don't this is just such garbage, penny pinching ridiculousness from a network that's been doing this stuff for years. So why should I be surprised? I, anyway, I, I, I digress. Let's not get hung <laughs> up on that anymore. I just had to, when we started talking about Jeremy fears and fouls and brought that to mind, I had to get it off my chest. How chest awful. clear. Now we can move on. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jackson Kohler, uh, three points, one to seven from the field. I struggled again, finishing like this sort of like, like the old Jackson. The last two games, he's looked a little bit different. I think otherwise he was, and he had some defensive problems, especially that one. I think the last time he maybe was in the game where they, uh, I think it's Cadeau split that, um, that the, the screen yep. and went right between them and laid it up. Uh, oh, for two for three, he had to split his free throws, five rebounds and uh, 13 minutes. So I don't know. An eventful day. It'll be interesting to see what happens from the starting line point, uh, lineup standpoint, yeah. the next game. You got We'll you see. got a you got a point. Um, I don't know that I would make that change because even even in like la against Memphis where Jackson didn't have a great scoring line, he still rebounded very well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I wouldn't say he changed, but I, I just... it's it's funny because I did think with North Carolina, I thought there was a possibility that Jackson would play a lot mm -hmm. because they go small it ended up being a bad game for him for whatever reason. He just was never able to get in the flow. And you would have thought that um, he could have gotten some things done in the post, you know, and that just yeah. never, that just never came to fruition. He never looked comfortable out there. Um, so yeah, just not, not one to write home about for him, but I, I guess I'd kind of be surprised. I, and I think with book, I, I think for right now, I, I don't know that you want to, you know, he, he finally played a game like this. I don't know that you want to, at least this would be my thinking. Why would you change what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, make, him, started make well. him put two or three in a row together and, and yeah, Jackson's not doing sure. his job, then maybe, but yeah, I, I but don't think I would look to do that. This team looked better out of the gate than they have in the last few games. And so whatever it is, right. I mean, in, in well, some ways, we always talk about it doesn't matter that much who starts because it's just your minute allocation at the end of the game, who's at the end of the game, you know. Those things matter yeah. more than who starts the game, except that you want it to be off to a decent start. And so that's what they got today. I, I think it would have been really interesting to see. And we talked about – I'll admit, I didn't think they'd do it here. I thought if it continued, you know, throughout Maui – because we talked about this. Yeah, but Fiddler, Making a change. Fiddler, yeah. yeah, and, and I, I thought there was a chance they would do it. I just didn't think it would come this quickly. Uh, but you know, it does make you wonder if Jace had been okay, been able to play, would they, would it have been him rather than Trey and man, did that, did that change work with Trey Holland? Yeah. Well, let's talk about him next. He led yeah. the team in scoring at 19 points, five and nine from the field, three for six from three hit all six yeah. of his free throws, seven assists, two turnovers, uh, a couple of steals, a couple of rebounds, steals. three seals. Yeah. had 30 played 36 minutes, played more than anyone else. And, um, you know, it reminded me that last time he started a game that I, the, when he came in and replaced AJ last year, he, I think yeah. he was, went five and five from three or something in that game and had yeah. a great game. And I don't know, this guy, this kid might be better off the, off the bench. I would, the only thing I'd say, you know, this first pass or two were a little bit like, especially the one that hit in transition to Jaden. It was, it was, you know, he's just kind of, he's forcing a little bit too much. I think is trying to thread the needle a little too much, but yeah, he does have enough really great lobs to um, cone car and stuff. So, you know, maybe, Oh, maybe you just kind of, you know, you say, well, you know, you're going to give up a couple like that. If you're going to get five, you know, three or four dunks, it's probably worth it. Trey Holloman and Jaden and, um, and, and um, Jeremy fears have made the lob game a weapon again for Michigan state. Yes. And here's the thing. It's not coming just, or even mostly off high feeds yeah they're getting some of that like the ones where cohen gets out in transition and they find him with a you know half court pass that yeah, stuff's right. happening but 
it's the stuff that's in traffic in half court. And a lot of that's going to Cooper. And look, I don't, uh, if people may disagree that I don't think Carson Cooper's hands have, have suddenly gotten <laughs> vastly better. I mean, he was a goalie and they're usually pretty good hands, right? Right. The guy making the pass, both of those guys, is putting it in spots and on time yeah. in a way that he can finish plays. This is why, you know, all the criticism of the bigs, some of it was valid. Mm-hmm. Not all of it. Yeah. Because some of it, in my opinion, you put squarely on the shoulders of the point guard, particularly with somebody like Cooper, because we've said this for the entire time he's been at MSU. He, I don't think he's ever likely at this stage to be a back-to-the-basket kind of player. But he can get you enough production. There are other ways to get points out of bigs. And one of the best ways is off pick and roll. Getting a rim dive and a Mm -hmm. pass that's on time and in the right spot so that the big can just go catch and flush it. And Michigan State is so much better in that area of the game this year than they were last year or the year before that. It's not even the same planet. Yeah. And you saw it tonight. You saw it, I think. What did Cooper have? Do you have a... He's three yeah, for three, he had a, six points. He had a couple of them. He had a couple yeah. of them. I th- well, he had, yeah. I think two, I think two of them were, were off the pick and roll actually. Yeah. Then another I'm, one. I don't remember how he got that, but yeah, no, yeah, uh, there, for sure. There, there, I think there was an offensive rebound, but um, in any event, um, yeah, it's making those guys, those two point guards, are making MSU's bigs better, mm-hmm. and they're making. We've talked about how they're making the offense better in myriad ways, but. Uh, that specifically is an area of huge improvement. And no, I don't think it's that Carson Cooper suddenly got a pair of hands. <laughs> the guys making the passes are a lot, lot, lot better at it. Yeah. Without and, and, and seeing it and just seeing it. Just reading the play and seeing that the opportunity is there and then making that play happen. That's I another area they're better. What's so impressive too is with Holloman going back to Holloman. I mean, six to six in the line. I don't think he even hit the rim on any of those six free throws. They yeah. were uh, perfect. His, you know, hit the th- went three of three in the first half and really four four. Although they they wiped yeah. that one out because he just released a little bit after the the Hornets. Yeah, out, that I guess. was a good. That was, oh, that's another one. Let's get to the referees. Let's deal with that. <laughs> um, been saying it over the course of this thing, and again, this is not to excuse Danny Hurley, but the officiating in this entire tournament has been borderline atrocious. It has been awful. And there's no better example than that play. Not because they waved off the three, because that was right. I thought it was the case in real time. Mm -hmm. Like it was pretty, uh, I was waiting for it when they, when they went to break and then they went back to the studio. I was, I'm not kidding. I was bracing myself for them saying, yeah, they would decide to wave off the three because I saw it happen. Yeah, but I was pretty sure it was late, but the fact that those clowns let the teams go back to the locker room and then had to call them back out to finish the last two seconds. What are we doing? Is this a junior high game? I mean, it was just, it was, it was atrocious. So So anyway, let's, let's talk about Jay Nakins. Uh, 14 points, six for 13 from the field, uh, missed all three of his three point attempts, two for two from the line, had three rebounds, assist, two turnovers. That one was, was that an overtime that went off his knee that when he got stripped? That was kind of yes. big one when he tried to drive yes. from the top yeah. of the key. Kid made, but, kid made a good play. Yeah, he I, did. And, you know. uh, but I mean, we, you have to like his aggression. You like the fact that when he's not getting his outside yeah. shots not going, he's still scoring, finding ways to, and he, he has been more creative with the dribble, I think, in this year. He has. I think for once, we were really seeing that when, you know, people have been talking about it, but we really haven't seen it until this year. Uh, and then defensively, he's been really strong, too. I mean, he really did a number on R.J. Davis when he was out guarding him. Yeah. Yeah, they did a good job on him in total, and a lot of that was Jaden. You're right. Of course, the way MSU switches, it ends up being a lot of guys contributing to it, but I, I, I did think he was very good. Look, I've got no problem with the game Jaden played. You'd have liked to have seen him, you know, hit another three, but um, otherwise, look, uh, playing downhill, looking to attack, and you're right. I mean, he's not, you know, the Tyson Walker role bit is is never going to come to fruition. He's not going to be Tyson Walker. It's okay. 
but that's okay. He's he has shown enough improvement with his handle that I I am to the point that I'm okay. I'm feeling comfortable with Jaden with the ball in his hands, looking to make a play, which I I wasn't in years past, and I wasn't even at the outset of this season. But we we're seeing him do it enough. And man, if the 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 best part is he's not settling. You know, it would be one thing if those yeah. moves were exclusively leading to him taking 15 foot jumpers, but they're not, he's, he's staying and remaining aggressive. That's, yeah. that's a big plus. So I'm happy with the way he played. Yeah. Last year it was the long jumpers that he, he'd do that, uh, and wasn't hitting them. Uh, so Paul is the other starter <clears throat> we haven't mentioned yet. Um, yeah. only played eight minutes, two rebounds, uh, turnover, not did not look very good. Didn't look very good last night either. I mean, there's maybe a bad matchup well, situation for him, but yes, he just looked, uh, I don't know. He just looked a little out of sorts. And I think just the, the speed and athleticism of North Carolina is maybe a little too much for him. I don't and, know. The, and the matchup he's not, this was just not a game for him. Yeah. You know, he, we, we've seen the highs and the lows for him in this tournament because I thought he was really good yeah, against, against, Colo- against Colorado. Right. Yeah. And right. so that's the deal. Now I'm going to tell you, a little foreshadowing for folks um <laughs> in the big 10 i think they're going to be more malone nights than they're going to be um jalen washington nights yeah so zapala is a guy and cooper too is a guy you need cooper was a better fit for tonight and the reason he played more is what you mentioned he's more athletic he's he's going to be better against a, f- a four guard team because with the way MSU switches, if he gets isolated on a guard, Carson at least gives you a fighting chance in the possession. Whereas Simone is just not going to be able to handle that. It's, it's yeah. not even so much about the guys that he's guarding primarily. It's when a switch happens, when he gets isolated on a mismatch, Carson moves his feet well enough. Carson actually, you know, Carson moves his feet better than Kohler too which is I, also part yeah. of it, why he played. I agree. Right. Tonight. Exactly. But yeah, I'm not down on Zapala. It was just, it, it's just not, not a game where he's, you know, he is what he is. We know mm-hmm. that he's yeah. not an all purpose big. He's a guy that gives you certain, certain things. He plays to certain strengths. And this was just not a game where, where those were going to come into play all that often. What's up with North Carolina? I mean, does Hubie Davis need to retire? I mean, doesn't seem like he can recruit bigs anymore. I don't know. Do you think they need to go <laughs> So, well, what's I'm that? just joking because you know there's always this you know like this team's not getting getting athletic Michigan State's not getting athletic bigs they're not oh they're Jesus. not recruiting right all this stuff and so and I mean uh, like looking at North Carolina you're like oh it's kind of the they're having they don't have you know it's not like you always have dominant bigs you don't need them but anyway we'll just let it go uh Kurt Tank came in for a few minutes he had a couple of missed threes um for, yeah. one of them was okay the other one he kind of forced uh, yeah. didn't do much Fiddler 13 points but what was impressive is he had 13 him. points with only two free throws. So this is like the opposite of yep. the other previously. So he's five for six from the field, one for two from the three. Uh, had a number of rebounds, three rounds. I thought he had an assist. He had a turnover, uh, 27 minutes, and he played Big really one. hard. I mean, he was really physical. And he had a lot of those plays that we saw in Moneyball, admittedly it's Moneyball, but especially in Spain where he gets 10, 12 footers. Uh, yep. He was just draining those. And I, he, I think he's had a couple early before, but I don't know if players have just been guarding it more because, I mean, I know he's missed those, but I feel like they were more open today. And I don't know if that's just because he was had a faster jab step or he's a little bit more aggressive. I don't know. He tried to get contact and he just get the fouls, but he was just hitting the basket, hit, hit it. So it was nice. Well, it was really good to see him finish your contact. You're right. He didn't get the benefit of the calls. But I'll tell you that, you know, the, the scoring – was great and the efficiency was great that was all really nice to see and so you could argue okay coming off the bench agreed with him you know he had he had his best game as a spartan but the reason why i think it was his best game as a spartan he had huge plays in the overtime the first exchange was massive msu comes down and i'm drawing a blank how they turned it over, but they turned it over on their first possession. Yes. And, and then he picked up Carolina, the from right? Kato, Carolina's yeah. trying to break and Fiddler makes the pickoff. It was big because yeah. it was just, if North Carolina had gotten an easy basket off that play right out of the shoot, 
yeah. in OT. After they just you, tied it. You would just have, much, right. Yeah. Instead, Fiddler makes that play, and MSU actually gets a four-point lead. Now, Carolina ended up coming back and taking the lead briefly again, but the fact that it, it stopped that from happening. Yeah. The fact when Carolina came back and took the one point lead, it didn't feel the same way it would have, in my opinion, if Carolina had come out, gotten a turnover and scored right out of the shoot. That would have been deflating. So huge play there. He had a couple of well, he had one man sized rebound in overtime. He mm-hmm. had another play where he deflected the ball out in traffic and MSU ended up with it yep. on a long yep. rebound. So Frankie Fiddler worked his ass off in this game made some big, it wasn't just, yeah, he hit shots. He made some effort plays and that's, that's all stuff that I don't know that we had quite seen yet. The other thing that's nice about it, you can't, you you know, we, you have people who worry about, well, he's transferring up and you know, will he really be able to adjust as the way you'd want him to, to a higher level of competition. Well, playing his best game so far against a North Carolina, pretty good sign that I think he can, I think he's okay. He can hang with them. I think he's okay. I don't know. I get, well, I guess we'll talk specifically with Booker, you know, 12 points, five for seven from the field, oh for one from three. And that was early. And then he had both his free throws, uh, seven yep. rebounds, which is, I don't know if that's his career high. It might be. It's up there. A couple turnovers, no assists, uh, 25 minutes. But as we mentioned, I mean, just play the intensity that he, we have not, we've never seen that. I don't think he was a defensive presence, not just the block, but the shots he altered. He yeah, was, and he, he was, was and, and he was really, with, he was even he on the was switches. Really comes good. Back. Yeah. Right. Really good there. He is getting obviously better. When I think back to where he was this time last year in that phase of the game, it is an entirely new player. Yeah. Um, he's a guy that I think you can you can feel comfortable with in that you're not you're not waiting for him to get exploited when he's on the floor defensively. Right. And in fact, as he showed tonight, he's actually capable, I think, of being a plus defensive player in terms of the way he impacts the overall game at that end. Um, the seven rebounds, three of them offensive. You know, and and some of that stuff that he got done inside came, you know, when North Carolina went small. Yeah. And that's what you, as I said earlier, that's what you want to see. You know, when Book's going against a lineup like that, and if we see that from some opponents as we go into Big Ten play, okay, go out and take advantage of it. And tonight he did. So I, I, I take zero away from him for having some dominant moments when North Carolina went small. That's what he should do, and he did it. And that has not been a given to this point in his career. So hats off to him. Definitely a game to build on. No question. Yeah. Well, you start, you know, you start, we we sort of imagined the possibilities before the season where you go through our preview, and you could you could see spots where you think, you know, this Michigan State team could provide a lot of interesting matchup dilemmas for opponents and yep. on the offensive end. And we're starting to see that in fruition. I mean, if, if Booker becomes this little bit more, you know, that's just another thing that's going to be uh, hard to sort of defend. And so we'll see what, what happens. And as you mentioned, he's a guy, he's got enough, he's got enough movement and length and certainly he can, and he can survive out there against smaller players on, on the defensive end and present different challenges too. So I, you know, again, we'll see, it's got to keep it up, but for this, at least the initial Initially looks pretty good. Uh, so finally, Cone Carr, uh, 14 yeah. points, six for eight from the field, uh, two for five from the line, uh, seven rebounds, a uh, number of them offensive. He was a couple of fouls. At 32 minutes, he played a lot. He was yeah. really good. There are a couple, there was like a couple sequences of the second half where I thought he kind of, he like dogged it down the court, got a guy blew by him, and that I think that yes. blitz come, come back. Yes. And the play right before that, or maybe just, Barely before nope. that, he had another You're 100% one where he was, right. he was a little. He kind of was like a little bit low effort or something. But to that, to, he, when he corrected that, and he played great down the down the stretch. I don't know. Is it legal for you to jump from the free throw line huh. to dunk uh, on a free throw attempt, or do you have to? <laughs> because that, I feel like that's his. That's if it weren't for him, yeah. Bishop would be shooting ninety some percent from the line from the free throw yeah. line this season. I think that's going to come around. Oh, I think it's. I really too. do yeah. too. It's, I, yeah. I don't. I, <laughs> I'm not. Gonna, but, I, I'm so happy he's out there. Don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, might be his best game. I know he's had, uh, he's had at least one game. I think maybe a couple where he scored more, 
but just total impact. I mean, seven rebounds. Col- well, that that's Col- the thing. The rebounding was with the, that's yeah. the thing we thought. That's a, he's got that in him, and just we hadn't mm-hmm. seen it. But uh, you yep. wonder if he's going to see a little bit yep. more of the offensive end too, especially. Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing. I mean, we have seen repeatedly this year Cohen Carr proving that he has got a versatile offensive game. It is no longer just dunks in transition or off lobs. Right. Um, and he's done it in the, over these three days. We've seen it. He, I think it was the Colorado game. Um, he busted out a, a hook like shot. A jump hook or something. Which yeah. if, the, if a jump hook is, is in his repertoire now, hey, that's a problem for people because mm-hmm. nobody's going to block it. It's almost, I mean, it's not quite the Kareem skyhook, but it's, you know, with how high he can elevate, it's going to be tough for anybody to block. Um, in this game, he had a couple plays where he was going to the basket and you saw him just get up so high and then extend so long that he was just, you weren't sure he had an angle. And then you just saw him able to drop the ball in the basket, just lay it in yeah. off penetration. Those are moves that, you know, you'd think with his, with his athletic ability, he should be able to pull off, but we haven't seen him do it up to this year. You know, we didn't see him do it in his freshman year. Well, we're seeing him do those things now. He is absolutely a viable weapon in terms of his ability to do some damage off the dribble. Now, you know, scouting reports change, all that stuff. Are our, our, our teams going to try to to do certain things in terms of how they play him? to make that harder. Yeah. They'll probably do that. You know, maybe dare him to shoot a little bit more. Uh, but I, the thing about Cohen Carr is he's one of those rare guys. Like, you know, if you're talking about a guard, you know, or even a garden variety, other type of player, you might say, okay, you can really affect that. But Cohen Carr is one of those rare guys with his athletic gifts that if you sag on him, he might still be able to make the play against you because he's going to go yeah. over you. You know, he's got, he's got that potential. So really good to see. And it, it, you know, you mentioned the downside with him. You're absolutely right. And I had exactly the same thought. There was a sequence in the second half where Carolina was really getting back into the game. And uh, they got a couple of transition baskets, both of which I thought were primarily Cohen's fault Yep, for not getting back. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, again, that's a learning moment. Cause I normally, I don't think Cohen's Cohen's engine, his motor has not been a problem this year. You know, I think he's, I think he's been playing consistent. It looks like he's, he's learned something about what it takes to actually play hard at a Michigan state level. Yeah. Uh, but though that sequence we mentioned just goes to show that it's not a hundred percent. And they're still learning, but, you know, he's whatever, eight games into his sophomore season. So um, yeah. it'll come. Just great, great, great game from him, though, overall. And, and defensively, he continues to do some really impressive things. I mean, he had one huge block, but again, he altered some shots. And yeah. then I just think about, you know, look, Carolina, you look at the numbers and you think, well, you played a horrible game defensively because Carolina shot really well, really mm-hmm. well. But I don't think that I think Michigan state played a pretty damn good game defensively. They were just going against, you know, that team has some, there's a lot of McDonald's all Americans on that roster, you know, and they got some guys that clearly can shoot. I mean, Carolina almost, almost hit 50% of their threes. That was a crazy, crazy number. Um, You know, and, and I think they're, you know, even on a night where you're playing well defensively overall, um, they're going to hit some shots on you. So I'm not really disappointed with the defensive effort. I think Michigan state, I wasn't disappointed with it in the, in the Memphis game really either. I think this is a good defensive team that Michigan state has. Yeah, I really do. And the offense is better in virtually every way possible, except for one. Yeah. And and you thought in the first half, you thought, okay, this might be the breakthrough game. Yeah. 40%, four for 10. And then, and then we had the second half, (laughs) but, but you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to take it because the shots that they hit in the first half really mattered. Mm -hmm. They were big shots. And, um, 
And and so at least with certain guys, I mean, I think Trey Holloman having a three for six night should be good for his confidence. Fiddler hitting one should be good for his confidence. So they got some guys on track, those two guys in particular, that I think needed, maybe needed to see the ball go through the hoop a few times to get their confidence in that area back on the beam. But look, this just as an overarching thought, we don't know what North Carolina is this year. We don't. I mean, they had a right. 12 sitting next to their name when they entered this tournament, but they come out of it one and two. Do I think they're the 12th best team in the country? I would lean toward the answer to that being no right now because I think they're I think they're kind of limited in some ways, particularly with their lack of size. Um, I think that they're going to struggle at times maybe to rebound and, um, you know, anyway. So we don't know what North Carolina is. So you can't say, oh, this is a massive win. But to me, the bigger deal is you come out of this this three-game tournament, two and one. That's a positive. You've got wins over two high major teams, at least one of which I suspect is is probably going to end up in the NCAA tournament. I think North Carolina is an NCAA tournament team most likely. I don't know where they're going to fit into the equation with this stuff, but with their guards, it's hard to imagine them not getting in there. So yeah. that's those are all big, big, big positives. I mean, I, I think that I think that you you if you can't be happy about what you saw over the last three days, I, I think you've got unrealistic expectations of of where Michigan State should be, where they actually are. And and then again, the potential for this team to continue to get a lot better. And let's not undersell that they did this without the guy that I think we all agree is probably to date at least their best player. Yeah, right. And he didn't play. And it's, and, 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 and it's, it's not like they're better because he didn't play. Like you could say some people are just right. ball ball, you know, dominant that speak that gives other people opportunity to, to shine. This is I mean, missing Jace right. was a big deal from def- just from a manpower standpoint. And absolutely, I was going to say that's exactly right. And especially in a game that was always going to be, in large part, about the guards, because North Carolina's got good guards. I mean, I don't. I, I said I don't. Th- you know, Seth Trimble would have been a guy I was comfortable with taking that last three in regulation, but he's turned himself and he had a hell of a tournament. I don't know. What did he, what did he score tonight? Cause he came in averaging. Well, he only scored nine tonight. So this was a down tick, but he still averaged um, like 17 points a game mm-hmm. over these three days. So he's turned himself into a hell of a player. RJ, RJ Davis has had one of the best careers in North Carolina history. I don't think that's an, an overstatement statistically i'm sure that that's true yeah uh, when you look at the points he assists the, all of the threes free throw shooting all that stuff mm-hmm. um cadeau looks much improved to me yeah over last year last year he was a guy who was terrified to shoot you know and and you look at him this year what did he have tonight he had, he had uh, 17 points yeah five, 10 from the field two for four from three he just said the biggest Six assists, field, four turnovers the biggest mi- missed layup in the game though but yeah he did he did and that was yeah that was a wild one yeah um but uh, he, he didn't have an easier shot all night but you know and then and then guys who were kind of quiet well they're wings like drake powell their freshman 18 points i thought he was <laughs> something else ian jackson 14 points another freshman though you see what I'm, I'm, I'm down to like, I've, I've listed five guys. That's yeah. a, that's a team with real, real talent at the guard spot. And so for MSU to stand up to that group and actually have its guards, I think responsible in large part for winning the game, you know, cause I count Fiddler as a guard. You look at MSU's guard and Carr is at least half a guard, you know, yeah, and you sure. add them to Aikens and fears and, and Holloman all being in double digits MSU took a punch and did it without the guy who might be better than all of them. Yeah. Well, let's uh, move on then. And we'll talk about the brothers, just who getters because they have that special um, do the drawing sometime today or tomorrow. I'm not sure what day it'll be, but so you still have a day, a day or so to get it in your, to get $300 of free gutter cleaning. All you have to do is just email me, Eric at TFFINOTS.com. Just have gutters as in your um, subject line and just your name in the email uh, subject uh, 
body and it should be fine. So just get that into me as soon as you can and we'll get you in that drawing for three hundred dollars of free gutter cleaning because the brothers just your gutters. They clean gutters. They get on the ladder so you don't have to. It is terrible right now with all the leaves and junk flowing around. So get that stuff out of your gutters. Make sure it's properly cleaned out because if it's not before all, everything starts freezing, it's going to cause all kinds of extra problems. Uh, but if you do have problems with your gutters, brothers are great people to call. They can repair things. They can replace it. Uh, they can, you know, like they can put leaf guards on so you don't have to worry about gutter cleaning in the future. Uh, so call them today. You can find a ways to contact and get an estimate at our support page at the final force on the skater.com slash support. Uh, you can get 10% off. You mentioned final four when you uh, get your estimate from either Kurt or Greg on the east or west side of the state. They're uh, working 20, you know, every day, <laughs> uh, 365 a year. So they'll take care of things. And so they also have great pricing. So contact them today. You'll be glad you did. Maybe you'll fix your gutters like I did. Um, so the player that Mitch said we had to keep in the gutter, uh, you, we didn't know who they were playing. So you said it was RJ Davis. And I thought, large part, I think they did a good job controlling him. He's the kind of guy you're not probably ever going to stop. Yeah, but you can, pr- exactly. you can minimize the damage. He had 16 points, 6 of 18 from the field. So 2 for 6 from 3, 2 for 3 from the line. So he didn't get to the line very much, which was a nice 7 assists, 1 turnover, uh, 3 rebounds, 37 minutes. I mean, he had a good game, but he wasn't he wasn't. He didn't break Michigan State's back, and I was worried. I kept waiting for him to just kind of bust out in the That's, second half, and he never quite go. did because Aikens. I think Aikens did a good job neutralizing him. Although all the guards, but I think Aikens was his primary defender. There you go. I think that's that's exactly where my my thought turns to. Um, you know, six for eighteen, and the, and he didn't make up for that by getting to the line much. Means he had a pretty inefficient game offensively. Yeah. You know, thirty three percent from the floor. When he's taking that many shots, you feel okay about that, you know? And I thought MSU really defended him aggressively and defended him well. Uh, you know, seven assists to one turnover, that's that's the kind of thing he's going to do. He's a really good player, you know? But yeah. I, I think you're right. There were definitely in the second half, there were stretches where I worried, oh, is this guy going to go on a two-minute heater yeah, where he right. busts three triples on you and it goes from – you know, five up to four down in a, in a blink, you know, yeah. he's that kind of player and he never was able to do that. And I think a large part of it was the way that Michigan state defended him. So you can't look, you can't say that they kept him in the gutter per se, but I think they controlled him and didn't let him turn it into an RJ Davis show. Yeah. And that, that was big. We'll just say he was downspout adjacent. So he was yeah, not okay, quite fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that he would, went four for 12 from two is really impressive because, you know, that's guys yeah. generally uh, shooting layups. Uh, so then Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids, they're the ones who can take care of cleaning your glass, and they sponsor the player that Michigan State player cleans glass best. Uh, if you need your glass cleaned in your house, your windows, or maybe just your house itself, it seems to be one or two shades browner or grayer than it used to be. Uh, contact the Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids. They can take care of that. They're power washing. They get on the ladders so you don't have to, just like the, uh, the brothers just your gutters. Stay off those ladders, folks. There's, you can have other you can have the pros do it. Uh, they, are, they are super nice, very professional, uh, great pricing. 15% off if you, as listeners of the show if you mention Final Four when you get your estimate. And again, you can get that at the Final Four on the schedule.com slash support. Uh, they'll take care of whatever window cleaning or house cleaning you need. They can take care of big, large buildings, small buildings, uh, Big jobs, small jobs. They even did the state capitol. So, I mean, they can do anything. So, contact them today. You won't, you'll be glad you did. Uh, so, it was tied at two to two. You picked Kohler. Kohler was looking yeah. good early. And then he just, sure was. was. Then he just disappeared because he played about 13 minutes and it was almost entirely in the first half. I think probably like two or three minutes, maybe in the second half. So, we ended up with five. Uh, and as we mentioned already before, Booker, Carr, and, uh, or Booker and Carr both had seven. So, Cool yep. not, and I had Zapala who had two. And of course, you know, we'll give ourselves a little bit of a break because we didn't know who Michigan State was going to be playing. Although I don't know that you probably would have changed your pick in at that point anyway, but I would have changed no, mine. No, I, 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 I wouldn't have picked I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pick changed Booker. it. <laughs> I wouldn't have changed it, but I, yeah. I think I think against Auburn, you, you might have seen Zapala a little bit more right. um, than you did in this game. So you might have had a better shot. But, um, yeah, look, it goes to show you this is kind of what we thought at the start of the season, that it was going to be very difficult to nail it on a night-to-night basis. And and then we started seeing Jackson and and uh, Zapala kind of emerging as the two 
consistent guys, but we've had enough nights like this. We had the Jaden Akins game. Now tonight you have Cohen and and Book both step up. So yeah, it's it's going to be a tough call. Yeah, I don't well, think I think it's going to be easy because you, you really at- you've really got to think about you've got to think about matchups. You've got to think about what kind of opponent they're playing what that's likely going to mean for MSU in terms of the playing time that's allocated and all those things. Yeah. Um, It it really, and and tonight it absolutely did Booker and Carr were better fits for this game. And and to their credit, they were playing well too, which helped keep them on the floor, but they, they made more sense in a game like this. Well, and you know, Kohler five rebounds in only 13 minutes. So he's averaging almost uh, one every two and a half minutes of rebound. So (laughs) Yeah, that is pretty impressive. I mean, you, you think to yourself you still could have won if had he played another, you know, six seven minutes. Now, obviously, that would have been different, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I don't think there's any question at this point that this kid can rebound. And so I, I maybe no one's saying that anymore. But <laughs> for a long time, no, like, no, he's they forgot that they forgot they were certain that he could rebound. I huh? will say this on a night to night basis, it's going to be very difficult to yeah. to nail it consistently with who's going to lead MSU, but. I'm going to be very surprised. A lot would have to change for me to believe that Jackson Kohler won't end up being this team's top rebounder overall. Yeah. Or certainly lead more games than than not for the team. Probably. I just uh, think he's going to end up, he's going to end up averaging more rebounds than anybody else. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Um, All right. So then we go to nudge printing, the keys to the game. Nudge printing is where you get all our prizes for our contests and getting close to the end. We're only about a week away before opening day, which is, I think, December 3rd or December 4th. I can't remember whenever Michigan State plays Minnesota. That's the opening day for the Big Ten. Um, So you have to get your beat rod contest entries into me. Again, 1 through 18, the final standings of of the Big Ten. Uh, The tiebreaker is how many points Michigan State scores against Michigan this season. They do play twice. Again, email that to me at eric at tffinots.com. Uh, get it to me soon so I can get it. I'll send out an email as a reminder for those of, those of you who are subscribed to Substack, which is another reminder to go over, head on over to Substack uh, where it supports the page. You can get then make sure you get the newsletter and get alerted when we have new uh, shows that come out. Uh, but Nudge Printing provides the gifts for the, for the contest, all kinds of Spartan apparel. It is getting a couple weeks till Christmas, so if you're still looking for an idea for the Spartan in your life or maybe someone who's, you know, not, didn't go to Michigan State, but went to a different school in the state of Michigan. That's not the University of Michigan. Uh, you can check out Nudge Printing at nudgeprinting.com. They have a huge selection of shirts and T-shirts, all screen printed, uh, made in Michigan, uh, high quality stuff, uh, great pricing. Uh, it's our famous favorite of our family. So if you need any sort of Spartan stuff, even the old like vintage Sparty, gruff Sparties and stuff like that, they have all that stuff there. And they're one of the few that have the rights to all those uh, logos. So check out Nudge Printing at nudgeprinting.com. And as listener to the show, 20% off if you type in Final Four at checkout. Uh, so I just made up five keys of the game since we didn't actually talk about it. One was just generally shooting because uh, one is threes. Could they keep the threes up from the game before? And then the other part of that was could they improve their two-point shooting because their yeah. two-point shooting was very poor against Memphis, which we attributed Memphis somewhat, but it, I think in somewhat to, um, uh, to Michigan State just not executing very well. And I didn't actually <clears> – <throat> So they shot 25% from three, so not good. Four for 16 again. Uh, but their two-point shooting was much better. Let's see. It was Outstanding. 20, 29 for 55. For 45. 29 for 45. Sorry. So yes. 64%. So again, that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's, that's, exactly. that's, what, that's more what they've been most of the season, I think. And and <clears throat> that's right. That's that's where, that's where you want to see this Michigan State team playing. And how did they do that? Well, this game, it wasn't a ton in transition, but it was, it was a lot of downhill play by their guards, um, mixed in with some effective mid range stuff. You mentioned Frankie Fiddler had a good game that way. Um, they had some other guys step up and hit some, hit some two point jumpers as well. But by and large, I think the biggest thing is just the way they're playing downhill. Yeah. They're getting they're getting to the basket and they're finishing plays. We talked about, you know, uh, Jeremy Fears getting guys on his back. Uh, Trey Holloman doing a great job at 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 penetrating. Jade Nakins doing a lot of that in this game. Cohen Carr doing some of it. Um, and then we also talked about the fact that the lob, not just the high feed lob to Cohen Carr, but even you know using the bigs off pick and roll. Yeah, right. So all of that stuff is happening right at the basket. So. 
if there's that level of activity happening at the rim, you would hope you'd shoot a good percentage, but yeah, 64% is outstanding. Yeah. Th this team is after yesterday, I haven't looked at updated Ken Palm stats, but I'm going to guess today's game, even considering the subpar performance against Memphis probably puts them somewhere close to being in the top 20 again, nationally from two. And that's a, that's a huge, huge deal. And it, it, it I, I know people want to go crazy over the three stuff, but when you're shooting twos this well, it mitigates a lot of that. If yeah. they were, if they were shooting twos in an average way, yeah, then you got a real problem, but they're not, yeah, I, they're one of the best two point shooting teams in the country. And it's, it's massive, massive improvement from the last four years. Yep. I'm Torvik. I have, I have them as uh 28th. They're at just a hair under 60%. Uh, and okay. they're 361 out of 362 for three point shooting at 22.4 percent. So that's okay. the, the contrast there. But uh, and their adjusted efficiency in offense is 60th, which is again, yeah, it's yeah, it's, 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 it's dependent on the fact that they're not hitting it's, threes right now. That's it's one thing that's hurting. killing them. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's move on to the another thing that's not killing them, and that is their rebounding. Um, uh, that was going to be important, especially. And that's where the core layer to that is whether they can get second chance points because they had 12 offense rebounds, but only six ch second chance points against Memphis. Uh, here they didn't have nearly as many offense rebounds, eight, and they were 29% uh, of offense rebounding rate, which is okay. Yeah. It's not great, uh, but they were able to get 11 points. And the, the nice thing is for North Carolina, they just totally demolished them. Or North Carolina yep. only had three second chance points on just a 16% offensive rebounding rate. Yeah. Uh, so, um, that that was huge, and that was um, that was you know, a, one of the reasons that Michigan State could did so well. With, I think it was a 37-29 rebounding edge against a yeah. team that's, you know, they're not really big as as they've gone up against other teams, but they're very athletic, obviously. Yeah, th this is very much a an atypical North Carolina team in in some ways. In other ways, it's normal the way they try to run the ball and yeah. tempo they play with and all that. But um, man, they are, they are not used to having this. And I haven't looked at all the rest of their games, but I, I have a feeling you're seeing these rebounding issues showing up and, and that's just not North Carolina basketball. I mean, North Carolina really it's, it's in some ways it's a, they've got similar profiles to MSU. Yeah. I was like MSU plus, historically, bit, historically you know? that yeah. they, they, they want to run off makes and misses, which almost nobody else does besides those two programs. And they've traditionally been a pretty good offensive rebounding team. You want to hear the numbers? Yeah, sure. They're 26%. They're 290, 287. There you go. And, in and offensive they're rebounding. And defensive rebound, they're 20, they give up 28%, which is 115th. So not bad, but that, so that adds up with what this game was yeah, because that looks like they, we they didn't let, they didn't really let Michigan state get loose on the offensive boards, which was a little bit surprising. I, I would have thought Michigan state could have done a little more damage, um, but it was okay. Uh, but yeah, they're just getting nothing off the offensive rebounding. And so tonight was illustrative of what they've been the whole season um, where they've just really, really struggled to make much of an impact. And honestly, I don't know what's likely to change it because they go so small at, at for long stretches. I mean, they just, you know, the one like semi legit big, because Jalen Washington is just not, he's six nine and he's long, but he's not, um, I don't know what minutes he, he only played 13 minutes in this game anyway. You know, yeah. the one, and, and uh, Lubin, who's their other, he kind of physically looks like a big, he only played 13 minutes. So I don't know how it's likely to get a whole hell of a lot better. And though I like their wings a lot, I don't see anybody, you know, there's no six, six Brandon Dawson's out there on that right. team. They're, they're, they don't have those guys or even a Cohen Carr, where you could yeah. at least think, well, theoretically he could maybe get there. Um, they don't have that. So I think it's going to be a season long issue for them. And that's one of the reasons why I said, we don't know what North Carolina is yet, but I, I think there are some limitations to that team that probably make it difficult for me to believe that they're going to be like a top 10 team. Yeah. I think they'll still be a tournament team because their guards are so good, but I, there are some limitations there that, you know, a team like Michigan state, frankly, doesn't have Michigan state does not have those issues. 
Yeah. You know, you can you can cry about the way Michigan State's bigs play in a particular game, but they've got legitimate bigs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They they have a chance in any game they play to make an impact, at least rebounding the ball, if nothing else, and and defending on the interior. You know, and that's another thing too. You could say. We said Michigan State shot 64% on twos, and they did a ton of damage to the rim. Well, I could argue that some of the difference in two-point shooting, because North Carolina was okay, but they weren't as good as Michigan State was, uh, a big part of that difference is the two teams having a very different profile in terms of what they can do defensively at the rim. You know, you saw Michigan State blocking shots in big moments, altering shots. A big part of the reason MSU shot 64% from twos is North Carolina doesn't have much of that. So anyway, third key of the game, I put down tempo or fast break, sort of who, if anyone got an advantage in that, I think neither team really did. They both play. It was a pretty, it was a pretty entertaining game. It was moving pretty fast pace. Um, And so I think, I don't even know. I didn't even look the fast break numbers, but I don't think 14, 14, 14 to 11 North 14 to Carolina. 11. Yeah. yeah. That seems about not a, right. Not a big, yeah. Not, Cause they had that probably the difference was that one burst we talked about. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, they didn't have, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's funny because these are two teams that said are mirror images of each other and have been ever since Izzo became the coach in terms of how they play in that area of the game. And normally you would expect that, Kind of and, and a game that was played fast, you'd expect to see more of it. But I give credit to both teams for, for the most part, being able to keep the floor balanced and not give up a lot of easy opportunities on the break. You know, they yeah. were both pretty disciplined for 45 minutes in that way. Um, and that hasn't always been the case when Michigan State has faced North Carolina. There have, there have been times where, despite the fact that we say with Michigan State, hey, anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere, in terms of, especially in terms of you want to run, let's run. But North Carolina has absolutely hammered Michigan State transition in games in the past. That did yeah. not happen today. Yeah, and that was kind of goes along with the next key, fourth key to the game, which was turnovers. You know, Michigan State had trouble in the, the Memphis game, not terrible, but enough that it caused a real problem in the points off turnovers. I hear the, kinds, were, the kinds of turnovers. Yeah, yes. there's here there was really no edge. Michigan State had twelve. North Carolina had eleven. The right. point off turnover edge was fourteen to eleven in favor of North Carolina. So basically a push, and so that really didn't affect the game much. Um, except I think you know. North Carolina obviously had some turnovers. Of course, you know, Michigan State had turnovers late in that overtime too. They almost were like offsetting turnovers that didn't yeah. end up giving anyone an advantage, which I guess goes to the point that no one really had advantage of turnovers the game. In a game that was played that fast, I think both teams were were pretty pretty solid. Yeah. In terms of not not brilliant, but solid. an overtime game that's played that fast to have turnovers be 12-11, that's a pretty reasonably sharply played game. And and, then, and the big thing is you mentioned it in contrast to the Memphis game, the kinds of turnovers Michigan State have were generally not leading to easy baskets the other way. Right. So that was a big difference. And the fifth and final key was attacking and free, th- which kind of is reflected by the free throw attempts and Michigan State with 31 free throw attempts. Uh, and not a whole lot of those were just to try and stop the clock. I mean, a couple of them were at the no. end of the game. But for the most part, those were mostly earned going into the rim. I mean, almost all of Jeremy's were. Uh, and so that was an edge there because North Carolina had um, 21. So it was, they were 16 for 21. We should say it was 24 for 31. So they hit more they than North edge. Carolina Epton. And so that... That was largely the difference in the game in some ways um, that Michigan State was able to score easily. As you mentioned many times, that it's an easy way to score when no one's guarding you. Unless you're Cohen Carr, then it's a tough shot. Um, just look, <laughs> man, um, they didn't they didn't get the easy buckets in transition today. But the other things that we've talked about as being really important for this team, earn points at the free throw line and get a lot done from two, they both showed up. And I think they were – you can say that they were a big part of the reason why Michigan State won is those two things, that they they earned free throws, got to the line a ton, and converted them, 77.4%. And, and that number was brought down by Cohen Carr's two misses at the end. It would have yeah. been even, you know, would have been up near 80, but yeah. for those. Um, so they're doing it. When you're putting that together, when you're shooting them so well and you're getting there a ton, man, 
That's a great world to be living in. And it's consistent. We're just, we're seeing this with regularity. It is by now, I'm, you know, it, we talk about the three thing likely turning around at some point because of track records and all of that. But that is, no matter how much anybody hates hearing me talk about it, that is uh, of everything you do in a basketball game, I think it's fairly well understood that shot making, especially from range, is is the most variable thing you know you can you can have a great look you can have good mechanics on the shot and it still doesn't fall that happens um it's the vagaries of shooting right yeah but a propensity to earn fouls and get to the line yeah you could have a given game where maybe the officials are are swallowing the whistle but by and large that's about a mentality it's also about the skill sets of the players and I'll, don't get me wrong and the offensive attack design yeah, yeah. strategy, but I think it's really as much as anything else, it's, it's an effect of a mentality. And this team is showing, I think that that's likely to be there consistently. And yeah, so that's a really, that's a, that's a strain that cannot, cannot be, um, talked about too much in my opinion as to a, a way that this team is just so much better than they than they were last year in some really important ways yeah and i and i think the the one difference in, from last year is you could there wasn't a whole lot of difference in the team going forward i mean you could see them getting executing a little bit better but this team you feel like there's so many individual players where there's so much more for them to unlock and it feels like they're starting to unlock that yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of reason to be very optimistic about this team and where they can go. I think yeah. I don't think we have any idea how far this team can go, and I don't well, think we're no for a couple months still. And and look, here here's the thing. That's that's all absolutely true. The other thing is, you look around the Big Ten, and you know, it, look, there's time for this to change, and somebody could emerge as a heavyweight. And certainly, there are teams that are off to good starts. You know, I think I think Oregon is off to a good start. Um, Wisconsin's off to a good start, you know, and the league has had some big wins, mm -hmm. but it's also, you know, I just, Indiana, which, you know, we talked about, so I, I picked them second, but I didn't feel good about it. And <laughs> second, but they, they wouldn't finish second. Yeah. They went right. And I think that's exactly what I said. And <laughs> I'm feeling good about that one after today. Yes. It's just one game in November, but that wasn't a loss. Like Michigan state's lost to Memphis. Okay. You lost. You're not happy about that you lost by eight points. The loss to Kansas, you lost by eight points. You, you shouldn't feel like the sky is falling. Right. Indiana got crushed, crushed by a Louisville program, a Louisville team that is, is fighting to come back from near death. I mean, it's been that bad and they, they weren't even close today. So, you know, Purdue's already taken a loss where I think it's very obvious that although I expect them to be a good team, a competitive team, they're not, they're not anything close to what we've seen the last few years. They're not likely to be at that level. So the, the upshot of this is that I think the big 10 is going to be pretty much what we talked about in the, in the preseason, a lot of, you know, a good number of good, capable, competitive teams. But there's no, I don't think there's anybody in the Big Ten that's looking, you know, the way Auburn does right now. Right. You know, um, or Kansas, you know, there's, there's, there's that, or Purdue the last couple of years. There's nobody like that. So there's every reason for the moment to feel optimistic about what Michigan State could do in this league. I really believe that. And, you know, those wins are going to matter because even if you're not talking about a bunch of heavyweights, you are probably talking about a whole bunch of top 40 teams. And mm -hmm. that's going to really help you in terms of metrics if you worry about seeding. And I, I don't get as caught up in that as others do. But if you are worried about it, I say this every year, that Michigan State has opportunities in conference play every year to make whatever case they want to make in seeding terms. Yeah. So November really is just an opportunity to learn, get a level check and get better. And it's great when you can win while doing those things as they did tonight. Um, but yeah, I, I, why be anything but optimistic about what this team can do? Now, if you're, if your national title or bust, okay, you're probably going to be disappointed, 
but I, I don't feel that way. I'm, I'm looking for this team to be better than they've been, um, to, to play, get, you know, to feel like they're going somewhere and they have a chance to do some things, like a really good chance to do some things at the end of the season. And I think there's every reason for the moment, at least, to feel like that the optimism that that can happen is on track. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, well, uh, hopefully everyone has a safe trip and travels to wherever they're going for Thanksgiving. If you're hosting, may your turkey turn out the way you want, or your ham. Uh, hopefully you've spent some great quality time with your family and have a day off work. Uh, for those of you working, hang in there. <laughs> feel for you. I've been there many times. Uh, so, uh, again, just visit our support page to find out ways to support the show or to find our sponsors. Uh, again, email me with the beat rod or for the gutter, free gutter cleanings at eric at tffinots.com. And so until next time, we start the Big Ten play. Mitch State heads back to East Lansing, a little bit happier with their full bellies. And so next, until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green. <laughs>